Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from the Mastery MuseScore School, uh, bringing you the MuseScore Cafe for today, uh, Wednesday, October, I'm going to guess 12th <laughs> and uh, 14th. Where does the time go? So uh, this is uh, my regular series of chats where I talk about some aspect of making music with MuseScore and... Uh, Always happy to have so many people here checking me out live and uh, participating in the chat. So um, the topic that I want to talk about, so for people maybe who are checking in for the first time, we're uh, <clears throat> kind of in the middle of what I'm calling a fall challenge where uh, we're just talking about creating a choral score, a score for multiple voices to uh, set some sort of uh, song about fall or autumn um, to music. And so uh, we've been looking at uh, what people have been creating, and I've been giving my uh, feedback on some things musically. Today I also want to talk a little bit more about the formatting of things, because as people are uh, score, kind of finished. score for multiple voices, <clears throat> ah, sorry to, about that. Uh, that set back. some sort of uh, song about fall or autumn. There we go. Okay, so um, I do have my uh, chat up over here. So, um, all right, uh, very cool. Every advantage has its disadvantage, or every disadvantage has its advantage. I like it. Um, every cloud has its silver lining is uh, an expression we have in in uh, in uh, English also. So, um, uh, so uh, good morning, good afternoon to people who are. Uh, in uh, Europe, good evening to people in Asia. Um, so uh, just always happy to have people from all around the world. I'm in Colorado for people who don't know in the United States. Um, so I am going to, uh, I am gonna just start going through a few things uh, that uh, feel like I've left hanging or that I wanted to make sure I talk about. But what I would love, if anyone is watching this, who has maybe a link to a a uh, score, a published score? Like maybe you can find the uh, a sample page online that we can look at for inspiration. What I'm uh, what I'm wanting to do is look at what some published choral scores look like and talk about some of the details of what they're uh, what they're looking like and how we can make uh, that happen in our uh, scores also. So let me, um, I've created a special workspace called Cafe so that if I do any customization, it uh, doesn't necessarily mess up anything else that I'm trying to do. So um, yeah, I'm gonna load up a couple scores uh, that I've taken a brief look at before but haven't really had time to get into and um, Uh, just uh, talk about some things. And because one I'm really curious to talk more about is uh, uh, the, the one score from uh, Andy, Andy Monger, I think is the name, who uh, is writing a barbershop uh, score. And I definitely want to take a look at that again uh, and talk a little bit about uh, barbershop music because I only know a little bit about it. Um, but I'm gonna um, play this score for you, and uh, and we'll uh, start talking. It's really pretty. It's uh, it's gorgeous. I think. Thank you. 
I, I think that's just beautiful and, you know, unlike anything else, uh, everyone's got their own style, their own different uh, ways of approaching uh, this project. And uh, it is just so fun for me to, to, to see and hear what people are coming up with. So, Andy, are you are you out there? Are you uh, are you uh, watching today? I'd, I'd love to ask you some questions about this and maybe get you to uh, talk a little bit about uh um, what you're doing here. Um, so he specifically mentions this as being a barbershop style piece, which um, is an interesting uh, association because it doesn't remind me of barbershop music that I'm familiar with, which I'm, you know, averagely, maybe a little more than average familiar with. Um, and so I do want to talk about what some of the um, uh, uh, conventions of barbershop music are just in case anyone else wants to try to write in that style and then we can talk about the extent to which uh you know this is exemplifying that um so if i were to characterize well there first of all there is a whole official uh barbershop society and like rules rules for their competitions for how the singing is done but also rules for how to write in barbershop style and they're very fairly specific about certain things like the fact that yeah everyone's supposed to be basically moving together like this except certain places where you can have uh some some voice hold a note while others move you know it, it actually addresses the specifics of issues like that but one of to me the defining characters characteristics of barbershop music um as I understand the the conventions or the actual rules of it are uh, having to do with um, where the melody is. And so I tried to show this once before, and I'm going to do it again because I can and it's fun. Um, I'm going to take this arrangement that I did. What am I looking for? I'm looking for standards. There are standards. Um, I want to take this... Uh, four-part arrangement that I had done of O oh Susanna at one point. And I'm going to play this for you. So that's first eight bars, good enough. <clears throat> Um, one of the defining features of uh, barbershop music normally, as far as how the rules are laid out, is that of the four voices, first of all, there are four male voices, right? And so the top the top voices are sung by tenors who have, you know, very high voices and maybe someone singing falsetto for the very top part. And when I say tenors, I mean tenor in the sense of the, the standard soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Tenor has a very specific meaning in the barbershop world because the voices are labeled, uh, what, bass, baritone, tenor, and lead, um, if I'm remembering the, the, the terminology correctly. And... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am set to live chat rather than top chat, so hopefully I'm not missing anything because I know I've uh, um, made that mistake before. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to make one change that's instantly going to bring this. So this wasn't written to be a barbershop arrangement, and so there's a lot of things about it that aren't exactly the way a barbershop uh, arrangement would would want to do things. But there's one really important aspect. In a traditional arrangement, the melody, well, let me just do that. The melody is the top voice, the soprano voice. And most arrangements of choral music are set up that way. Um, so I'll, I see this question coming in. I'm going to address that when I'm uh, finished with this point here. Um, so normally the, the top part is the melody. In barbershop music, this is very much not the case. It's the second to top part that is the melody. The top part will be some other part, a harmony part laid on top. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take voice two, and I'm going to do that by going to my selection filter here, and I'm going to unselect voice one, so only voice two is selected, and I'm going to hit control up arrow to raise voice two up an octave. So I now have my alto part above my uh, 
soprano part. Now this is going to sound funny because it's too high. Like even even in barbershop, the person singing that highest part falsetto would not be singing an A that high. But on the other hand, there is the Sweet Adelaide Society, which is uh, um, women's barbershop, basically. And it's the same thing, except maybe the ranges can differ. So um, I'm just going to play this to give you a basic idea of what it sounds like when the harmony part is above the melody, and that this is one of the things that barbershop can do. <laughs> I'm actually going to stop it, um, and I'm just going to play a little bit with, uh, so I still have just voice two selected, and I'm going to actually switch that around. I'm going to take voice one only and select just voice one and just its notes, and I am going to turn them up. I think this is going to work. If not, then I can use the mixer for it. it depends on this new, well, new-ish single note dynamics feature. Yeah, I think for harmonica, maybe that didn't actually uh, work the way I wanted it to, um, because uh, if if single note, no, single note dynamics are not. So I'm just going to guess that that worked, and I'm just not hearing it that well. But I turned up the melody volume is what I is what I tried to do there. So let me just play it again. So just by doing that, just by taking normal four-part writing techniques, but putting the melody as the second to top note and adding additional notes on top instead, it instantly pulls it more into the barbershop realm. There's some other things you should do, like probably use a, a, a fewer inversions that I'm using, use more root position chords, although inversions are still good, and try that much harder now to get that alto part to be really more stepwise in motion, uh, less leapy. Because the, these, the, I do, the fact that I start right off with these leaps is, um, it's fine for an alto part, and it's probably fine for the top part in a barbershop group, but it does, it does call a little more attention to itself and detracts a little bit more from the melody. And so it's like one of these things you have to think about that much harder in writing barbershop music, how to keep that top part from feeling too distracting. And so smoothing out the voice leading becomes that much more important. So the question I see that came in is about um, uh, how vocal arranging differs from instrumental music. So if you have... Uh, if you're writing for mandolins and various other stringed instruments, first of all, when you're doing that, all those instruments are capable of playing chords, right? But if we assume that you're creating your instrumental arrangement for one note at a time, people are just playing individual melodies. Because if you're arranging for a large ensemble like that, that would be pretty typical that you would just have everyone play single note lines. Um, then my my simple off-the-cuff answer is, well, it doesn't really have to differ that much at all. I mean, yes, it does. You have to know the individual ranges of things. You have to, uh, you have to make sure you don't use two notes at a time because obviously you can't. Um, so to some extent, instrumental arranging skills carry over to writing for voice. I say to some extent. There's practical realities in the world. So for instance... I can write the following. All right, I could write this melody right here. And I can sight read that thing on the piano. If I were a mandolin player, I who was a who could read music reasonably well, you could sight read that thing on the mandolin. And even if you don't sight read all that well, you could learn that in a matter of minutes. Um, 
or less than a minute. This, on the other hand, would be really, really difficult to learn to sing. And the thing is, you could learn to sing this melody. I could do it. Um, I could learn in a minute to sing this melody. And if I only have to sing it by myself, I'm good. Put me in a choir and I have to sing that melody while everyone else is singing their parts. It becomes really, 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 really hard. So there are certain things having to do, and this is a crazy example, right? It's it's all leapy. But even if it wasn't so leapy, even if it was just things like uh, even if it was something like this that's mostly stepwise, Um, it's still uh, a little bit hard to sing these intervals that are highly chromatic like that, that have so much chromaticism in them. Now, I will say that that's one of the hallmarks also of barbershop music, because barbershop music is going to rely so much on secondary dominance. Um, and so here I get to talk about harmony again, and you know I love talking about that. And as you've all probably seen, I have my new harmony course that I'm all excited about, but I'm taking a break from thinking about it so I can think about this, um, but I'll, I'll mention it again in a minute. Uh, so this little chord progression right here is all dominant seventh chords. Actually, this one isn't a dominant seventh. Make it a dominant seventh. So that chord progression, all dominant sevenths going down the circle of fifths, it's all secondary dominance. It's a, it's secondary dominance are a thing in, you know, in harmony in music for centuries they have been, but the way Barbershop uses them to a maybe greater extent, kind of chaining them together like this. And so you end up with these parts that are F sharp, F sharp, F, E, E flat that are these chromatically descending lines and the little ace they'll go up also because there's other types of chromaticism that get used. So if you're going to be singing in a barbershop group, you do learn to to deal with these lines that are very much more chromatic, more including notes not in the key that are resolving by half step in these kind of really tight ways like like this line is the sort of line you might see in a barbershop arrangement just because of how all the secondary dominance and other uh, chords that are common in barbershop uh, harmony get used. So anyhow, those are some things you think about, but the other one is breathing, right? Singers have to breathe. Mandolin players don't have to breathe. Well, you have to breathe, but it doesn't stop you from playing, but you got to breathe singing. And so you can't just write a constant stream of notes and expect it to come out the same, you're going to want to have rests in there. So there's, there's considerations like that. And, uh, you know, but it's music is music. A lot of the same principles apply. There's just details you need to worry about. Just like if you're going to write for mandolin, you're going to have to think about certain details. Like if you're going to play two notes at a time on mandolin, well, you can't do that if the two notes both have to be played on the highest string because or both have to be played on the lowest string, I guess I should say, because um, then there would be no way to physically pull that out. So, um, yeah, so as far as rubato goes, uh, and this is good because if you are creating choral music, that's going to be a thing. Um, here is my best answer to that. Uh, so, no, it's not going to just magically do it for you. But what you can do is you can add a uh, text here, and I'm going to add a uh, system text, control shift. T and say rubato. Um, the reason I added a, a system text is if this is a score for multiple instruments or multiple voices in which I'm going to extract the parts individually, then system text will appear on every part. So I've uh, put in my rubato, and then what I might do is add some tempo markings, which is shift alt T. And my tempo markings, I'm just going to put on every note and then make them invisible. Uh, I'll just go ahead and go with that. 
So there is a plugin for like if you want to just do uh, retardando or accelerando where you just want it to gradually get slower or gradually get faster. There is a plugin that will do that for you. You have to download it from the MuseScore website, but when you do, you'll see uh, tempo changes. And if I select uh, some music and go to the plugins menu, tempo changes. Uh, has some controls that basically let you control how much, how fast the tempo slows down, etc. It's a great plugin. Um, but let me just add uh, one or two more of these things. So when I mark these invisible by pressing V, I still see them in gray so I can edit them, but they won't print. There you go. So you you know, as long as you don't mind programming in the playback, that's basically uh, how you can do it. Probably someone could come up with a plugin. In fact, boy, that plugin had that graph, and boy, wouldn't that be neat if the, if it let you just put in all sorts of different control points? But I think it's not really meant for that. I think it's gonna just be. Yeah, I think it's just about some very basic. Uh, I don't even know. I, I've used this before. I got to put in my tempos, but I, yeah, I, I think this is not an editable graph. I think it's just showing you the result. And then, but I can fiddle with that midpoint there. And so, there's some things you can do to play, but it's it's kind of then put in its own invisible tempo markings. So it did its own, but it was definitely slowing down gradually. There's no way to make it then speed up again. So there's that. Um, watch the director. Yeah, that is a excellent. Um, uh, so yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So if you want to put in, I, I would just put in these invisible tempo markings. You know what you want. MuseScore doesn't. So you just put in the tempo markings and it will gladly do it. I want to, uh, since you mentioned uh, Fiorelice, uh, I have uh, that, I think, uh, I have a, like a, a little bit of an analysis that I did for my uh, for my Harmony class. And so I have that score handy. Um, and I do just want to show something about it. Um, so the way it's typically played, so... That's, you know, dee, 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 dee. so people would often like to take those first few notes and do things with them, make them more dramatic, whether it's speeding it up, slowing it down, whatever, really kind of calling attention to those. Often people go, ba, do, da, do, da, bu, ba, da, and right, start off slow and then accelerate into the thing. That's a common device for how people approach music like this. Um, I also liken it to Moonlight Sonata. Moonlight Sonata, people love to play the first three beats crazy slow. Boom, 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 boom. And then gradually speed the thing up. I think I've also got that. Uh, do I have it actually in the same folder? No, it's not in the same folder, but I do have that score too. But people like to really play the first measure of Moonlight Sonata slow. It's like, hey, I'm playing a slow piece. And then you realize, oh yeah, but if I played the whole piece that slow, it would take a half hour to get through. So then they kind of speed up. So this idea that you might play the first couple measures at a different tempo than something else, or in choral music, that could be really common. Um, it's definitely a thing. The analogy I like to make is, I don't know if anyone saw the movie Sling Blade, um, it's kind of what put Billy Bob Thornton on the map. He kind of wrote and directed and starred in, if, as, as I recall. Um, but in this movie, he plays someone with some uh, mental uh, mental disability issues. And he has like this major kind of speech impediment, you know, or just wit manner of talking that when he first opens his mouth in the movie and you realize, Oh my God! I'm going to have to listen to this for two hours. I, I, I'm, I. He is so hard to understand what he is saying and to follow him. Um, and then three minutes into the movie, it's, it's you're, you're accepting of it. And I think that's in part that he exaggerates his vocal mannerisms for that first minute to really make the impression that he wants to make. 
and then says, all right, now I'm going to moderate that a little bit to make it, uh, um, you know, more manageable for, for people to listen to. And I think people do the same with music. They might really exaggerate some aspect of what they're trying to do um, musically in the first measure or two, and then maybe uh, moderate that after that. So anyhow, that's a thing. And and I'm realizing as I'm say, saying that, that that probably came off as insensitive to speech impediments, and that's not um, not my intent. So I apologize for that. But it's, uh, yeah, um, something I remember feeling at the time. So, uh, all right. So I said that I wanted to talk some about uh, um, the physical, the visual appearance of the score. So what I want to do is there are any number of uh, publishers whose music is really uh, popular in the choral community. Or, and uh, I know, I mean, J.W. Pepper is huge in a lot of things, so I'm definitely going to look at some of their music. There's probably other ones that are sort of specific to the... Uh, um, so I'm just going to go for a, uh, okay, adult community choir. Let's see what this looks like, because that's probably something relevant to some people's work. Spring Carol. Oh, look at that. There's a season-related one. I want an autumn one, though. Um, but whatever. Let's take a look at the Spring Carol. Um, I just want to look, because they hopefully have a sample page that we can look at, based on text by Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, okay. So uh, this piece... Oh, come on. I didn't say I wanted, to, but I wanted to see the sample page. Oh, there we go. So one thing you can see is that all the parts are prepared, the instrumental accompaniment part. Okay, well, this is not that useful then. That says SATB, um, so I don't know what was going on there. I uh, That was instrumental parts, I guess, that we were just looking at there, and I wanted to see uh, the SATB version. So, unfortunately, that didn't work out so well for me. But I wanted to see what... Um, you know, what some music in this genre might look like that we could just take a look at. So I'll take a look at their next example and see if that one works any better for me. So this particular one is written on three staves. It was, I think it said SSA, soprano, soprano, alto. Um, so it's written on three staves, and we could look at that. And so, um, you know, that's then it has the those staves uh, at the top. Then we have the accompaniment. The accompaniment, we have the piano part here, and then we have uh, a percussion part. I heard claps and snaps and things, so probably that's what those percussion things are referring to. Um, so those that's some things you might want to know, is that uh, the, the vocal staves are going to go on the top, and then the accompaniment, and there's a traditional order to accompaniment uh, in, uh, in this genre, I would expect piano to appear above percussion. Um, bass would appear between them. Guitar sometimes is above piano, and sometimes is below piano. I've seen it both ways. Um, so one of the things that's coming in MuseScore 3.6 is that MuseScore is going to know some of this stuff. And, and MuseScore 3.6 is coming fairly soon. Like they're really uh, trying to be aggressive and get it out by the end of the month or at least early next month, I think is probably more likely. But in any case, it's going to know how to arrange your staves for you. And so there's certain things like the fact that the vocal staves were on top and they have a bracket connecting them. And then the piano staves have, have this brace connecting them. And then the piano staves are also connected by bar lines within, but the vocal staves are not because that would get in the way of the lyrics. These are all things to kind of know about how your score is laid out. So um, if I want to set that up, if I go to create my score, I might say, well, if I just use one of the templates, hopefully the templates are set up pretty well. 
but let's find out. Uh, is SS, let's see, SATB and piano, I'll use that one as the closest. So when I use the SATB, I do indeed get the bracketing there, and I do indeed get the brace here, so that's good. And I have the uh, bar lines connected here, and I have the bar lines not connected there. So good. We, we did a, a decent job on the template at least. But if you're creating the score yourself by instead of using the template, if you had gone in and said, hey, I want to choose my own instruments, and then you said, I'm going to add a soprano and a soprano and an alto, and then add a piano, and then add the, let's see. Oh, uh, I'm going to guess that that was all body percussion, and body percussion isn't showing up on the list here, so I'm going to come here and say body. Oh, that's th that's right, because that's a, uh, oh, I was thinking there was like one staff I could add for that, but I'll just call it hand clap, and then I'll add other, add other sounds to it if I need to. Um, so hopefully this, so when I did this, it at least did connect the piano staves and didn't connect those staves, but it didn't put the bracket on the vocal staves. So I need to do that myself. So I'm going to select those three staves, click, shift click, and come over here to brackets and click the bracket. I think it wasn't that easy in previous releases. I think you'd have to drag it to the first staff and then drag it down to cover the others or something like that. But we've, uh, we're have we gradually trying to simplify the process of, of creating scores in a, in a nice uh, format. Uh, and so that's one of the, the big things coming for 3.6 again. But in, even in 3.5, this, what I just showed with how, how you can add the bracket by just selecting and clicking, that's in 3.5. So one of the other considerations when I look at this score is, oh, oh, first of all, so when we were talking last week and I had said, you know, I'm not so sure if these slurs are so necessary for melisma. And I was, uh, I was uh, very, um, very emphatically reminded or informed that, yeah, they really are important. And so by all means, far be it from me to... Uh, tell you not to do that then. So the slur indicating where the melisma is, where this note that's uh, um, uh, continuing. I'm looking at this and I'm being very distracted by the fact that this slur is added to me incorrectly. And I don't know if this is some special vocal thing, but let me show you what I mean. Uh, if I enter those notes, let me just put in a line break there, and I enter some notes, uh, You see what that was. It was B tied to another B, and then an F tied to an F, and then a B. Okay, so first of all, there is no reason in the world that F should needed to have been tied. That could have been a quarter note. So I'm I'm a little, although I guess it's oh I see it's because the lyric changes on it. So now I'm really confused as what's going on with this tie. Maybe this is. This is confusing me, to be honest. Um, I'm looking at this, and I'm not understanding. I thought that that was a tie, uh, but why would you tie into a note if you're supposed to uh, sing a syllable there? That's not making a ton of sense. Um, but normally, slur. if this was a tie, then normally the slur shouldn't just go that far. It shouldn't just go to the first note of the tie. Slurs should normally extend all the way to the end of the tie is the normal rule. Sometimes if the tie continues over several measures, the slur would get too big and then they'll shorten it. But the normal rule is that slurs encompass ties. But um, this there's something funny going on in here um, with that. Uh, so apparently this line isn't um, doing what I think it is. So I don't know if people who... Uh, are really more familiar with vocal music can give me some reason to say, oh, I understand what that line is. It's not a tie or a slur. It's a mm, whatever it could be, but really I'm not getting it. I'm not understanding what that is uh, meant to be conveying. Now this one is more clearly a dotted one. And then that somehow lets me think that it's got some significance like, <sighs> 
yeah, I just, I, I just don't even know, to be honest. Um, so whatever's going on there, that's like a thing that because I don't live in that world all the time, if this is a common thing that I'm supposed to know what it is, I don't know how to tell you about that. And, and if someone tells me what it's used for, um, so, uh, Wolfram, no people interested. Lots of people are interested. That's why we're all here. So, um, uh, yeah, there's, a. I, uh, I see there's, I don't know, I, I don't see the count right now, but there were like dozens of people watching earlier and there will be hundreds uh, by the next day or two once everyone has a chance to watch. So yeah, there's tons of people interested in this. So, um, or m maybe by this program, you just mean this particular chat, but yeah, I think people are just, uh, just listening. Okay, so if someone can tell me why you would want to add that, I would love to know, and then we would all be able to know that, but I can tell you how to add that. So I added it as a tie because I'm sort of thinking it's a tie, and now that I've selected the tie, I can come over here to the inspector and change it to dotted or dashed. And if I thought it was a slur, it would be the same thing. So I press S to enter my slur and come over here, uh, select the slur and do the same thing, set it to dashed. So if you're convinced that you need that dashed curved line for whatever reason, you enter it either as a tie or a slur, whatever, whatever's closer to what the meaning is supposed to be, and then the inspector will let you set it that way. One of the other things that I see going on here is um, the dynamics are above the staff. And in MuseScore, if I enter dynamics by default, they're gonna be below the staff because for instrumental music, that's the most common. But we don't do it for vocal music because lyrics are gonna have to go there. So what I would do is select, uh, after entering the dynamic, press X and that flips it above. Now, if your music is all vocal, and so literally every single dynamic marking is gonna be above the staff, then you can just come over here to, uh, um, the inspector and see where it says placement. It is now above. That's what changed. I'm going to press X again. You'll see now it says below. Now it says above. If I press Control R to reset it, uh, yeah, then it, below was the default. So when I press X, it goes above. Um, but then if I press this S icon here, and uh, okay, there's some chance my face is covering that, right? Some chance my face is covering it. Um, so, uh, in any case, there's an S icon next to most of these settings, right? That means set as style. So as soon as you've changed a setting, you press that S and now it is the style setting. And now all the other dynamics I add will also be above the staff, which is going to be great until we get to the piano part. And then we're going to wish they were below again. Although I suppose I could add them to the bottom staff and, and have that work out okay. But so that, that's your choice. But one of your other choices is instead of setting it to uh, doing that set as style, what I could do is just go ahead and add all my dynamics below and just live with the fact that they're funny for a moment. But then when I'm done, right click one and say select all similar elements in same staff. Now just the dynamics on that staff are selected and I can come here and explicitly set the placement to below or above. I didn't want to just press X because with some of them above and some of them below, they just would have flipped exchange positions. The above ones would have gone below, the below ones would have gone above. But if I use the inspector to change it specific, explicitly to above, then I get them all above. Um, now that's dynamic markings. Hairpins, like if I press the le the uh, less than sign to give a crescendo, I'm gonna have to do the same for because hairpins and dynamics are separate element types. But the same, uh, the same concept will apply if I set to above and I can possibly hit set as style if I want that. So to get all the dynamics above, you would first select all the dynamics, set them above, then select all the hairpins, set them above. And uh, you can do that. And also because there's maybe dynamics across different staves, what I could do is instead of that on same staff, I could select all three staves. So I've got, I've got, I clicked the top staff, shift click the bottom of the vocal staves, and then shift control end 
to select to the end of the score. So now I have everything on the three vocal staves selected. Now I can right click a dynamic, select all similar elements in range selection. And now those dynamics are selected and I can set them to below or above. And so if I had dynamics on the piano staff, they would have not been affected. So th those are some techniques for selecting some things that are uh, real useful. Um, okay, so to notate improvisation, um, uh, there's a number of ways to do that. But the, the most basic thing to indicate something is improvised is to use slashes on the staff. And so if I select a couple measures like this and then go to the tools menu, and say, fill with slashes. That's the easiest way. Um, there are other techniques above and beyond that, um, but that's the, that's the usual thing. By putting slashes there, and then maybe you'd put some chord symbols over there, like Control K to enter a chord symbol, and I say C7, and uh, um, now it's telling the person to improvise with a C7 chord. So that's a... Uh, a, a typical way that we indicate improvisation in music. Um, so yeah, it looks like no one else is uh, particularly uh, uh, understanding what that particular slur or tie is. I, the fact that the, it really looked, um, well, those don't look dotted. Just This just looks like low resolution a scan or something. That's a horrible over. Look at those. <laughs> look at that hairpin. Um, but this one over here really looks dotted. Or maybe that's just low resolution also. Really, to be honest, I don't know what's going on. So um, fancy PDF folder with the most useful shortcuts. OK. Um, oh, I can give you that. I can totally get you my, uh, my list. I have, at this point, it's no longer exhaustive because uh, um, The, you know, there's constantly new shortcuts being added. Uh, the last time I updated it was probably six months ago. And so there's probably a handful of shortcuts that are missing from it. But if I come to my uh, um, my Mastering MuseScore course, I think... Well, I think this uh, is available as a free preview. Let me uh, let me figure that out real quick. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to post that link into the chat. So this is a fairly complete list of the shortcuts that uh, get used on any sort of regular basis. There are a few shortcuts that exist for things that most people would never use that I didn't put on here because I, I wanted it basically to fit on two sides of a piece of paper. So I have it in letter format and I have it in A4 format. So when you print it, then you can just fold it in half and have a little, uh, a little cheat sheet. And so it's got pretty much all the shortcuts for node input for, uh, all sorts of different things that you can see in here, navigation, selection, editing. Um, and yeah, there's new shortcuts that are added, so it's not always up to date. If you go to the MuseScore handbook on the MuseScore website, you will also find um, some shortcuts there, but I think they're not all of them in one place. So uh, drag dynamic with a mouse. Yeah, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. So what's the question here? Can you adjust the distance? Okay, yeah, so instead of dragging, dragging is always gonna be slow and imprecise. So if you're not happy with this as the distance, if you would prefer them, like I could drag, but if I try to drag it, it's gonna take forever to drag each one, and now they're all at different distances. So I'm going to uh, undo those offsets there, control click them, and then undo it. And what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just gonna drag, move one of them. And I'm not gonna drag, because if I drag, it's probably going to go sideways. It's going to be kind of imprecise. I'm going to use the arrow keys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Every time I press an arrow key, it goes down by a tenth of a staff space, or control arrow moves by a full staff space. 
So if I want it here, great, that's where I want it. Then again, I can use the set as style button and boom, all the dynamics move very precisely to that same distance. Now maybe that's too close for some note because maybe the note goes higher, but automatic placement bails you out. So if you have notes above the staff, yes, the default is to be closer to the staff, but automatic placement does its job and moves other dynamics further. If you're dragging something, chances are there's a faster, better way of doing it. It's almost never the best way to drag anything, almost ever. Um, it, dragging is, it's always possible, but it's almost always going to be slower and less precise than uh, using some combination of the keyboard and inspector. If you're only moving one element, fine, yeah. But if you're trying to, if you're talking about dynamics as a whole and you want them to to be nicely lined up, which you do, you want your dynamics nicely lined up. Dragging is not going to be the way to go. Um, so anyhow, that's uh, something to know about in general. Um, uh, all right, <laughs> thanks for the nice comments here. Um, so let me. Um, so, so it does seem at this point that maybe I picked a uh, less than ideal example. Would we say that that seems, I'm trying to get back to where, oh, there is my score. Um, that this score, since we don't, uh, since the scan looks re low resolution and we don't really understand what that uh, one slur was about, uh, it feels like I'm striking out in my choice of scores. But let's see if, uh, if third time for charm. Well, it's low resolution. Okay, now look at these. These are definitely. Slurs. Uh, because now it's not the same pit. And it's definitely DAP. Turn off that playback. Um, so I'm thinking now maybe it's a, a marking about breathing, telling you not to breathe between those two notes. Does that seem uh, plausible to anyone? Uh, can't save or print the PDF file. Oh, really? Um, let's see what happens if I do. So I'm over here and I say download. Well, that worked fine for me. So I'm using the link right below the PDF, right below the, the visual, the visible display of it. I'm just clicking the link below it where it says download and that's letting me save it. So, and, th and this is my, uh, incognito uh, browser, so it's I'm not logged in, so it doesn't know that I'm the creator of this file, so that's fine. And it also seems there might be other ways. Now, yeah, that looks like that's the way to go. I don't know. What is that down here? Oh, that's a page turner. So yeah, this, this link here should be working, and it definitely works for me. So, um, uh, so yeah. I, the breathing, so Andrew, are you agreeing with me that breathing seems like the most uh, likely uh, choice here, that it's telling you not to breathe, to kind of uh, just, you know, not breathe between those two notes, basically. Breathe somewhere else. So when I mentioned elsewhere that breathing is a thing, then what, what's going to happen in a lot of choral music, if you don't want there to be a noticeable breath, you tell people where not to breathe. And then you let people decide for themselves where to breathe other than that. And then the hope is different people will decide to breathe in different places and not everyone will breathe in the same place. And you'll have the illusion of a whole choir not breathing. If, if you tell them, hey, everyone breathe here, we're going to hear. Everyone's going to breathe there. But by telling them where not to breathe and then letting them make some other choices on their own, um, you can get this effect where everyone breathes a slightly different place, or you could just, you know, maybe work that out amongst your choir. So as far as what you would need to notate in there, uh, they chose to mark these don't breathe things here because I guess it was particularly important to them um, for whatever reason. Uh, I've, I've seen dash lines used like that. It looks like it's not actually used all that commonly in this score. So we kind of got lucky or unlucky, but here's another place where they're apparently telling you the same thing. Um, so uh, that's a thing. Yeah. So the if you want to tell someone to breathe, then it's, then the marking that you use there is a comma. Actually, it's more like an apostrophe because it's above and it's under the breaths uh, thing here. So breath, 
right there. There's multiple different symbols. Some people use that symbol for a breath mark. Um, and uh, this is another symbol that sometimes gets used. This one I'll drag because... So that is a symbol that gets sometimes used also. So these are the three symbols that I typically see to indicate breathing, but mostly I see the uh, comma or apostrophe symbol like that to indicate breathing. I don't even know this one here. Breath. Uh, that's another breath mark, I guess. Uh, comma with a line over it. I've never. I've never seen that one personally, but uh, it must exist, and some publisher must use it. NB for not for no breath. Okay, that's that is great to know also. So yeah, I'm looking through here, just looking at other things to talk about. Uh, if I see stuff going on um, that we would have to take special care to get right in MuseScore. Oh, look at this one. The piano part is small relative to the vocal part. Um, if you want to do that, let's go into the piano part. I'm going to right click the piano part, staff part properties, and set small. Now, when I do that, it's literally only that staff. So you'd have to do it each staff at a time, small. But what I can also do is if I, I think I have to hit apply. That's something I wish someone would change. Um, but so uh, I'm, I'm going to find that out in a second. I marked that one small, but then I got these arrow keys down here, and I can go down to the next staff and set it to small also. But because I never hit apply, uh, it it didn't actually apply. So let me go back up, reapply, small, apply. So if you want to set a whole bunch of staves to small, you'd go small, apply, down. Small, apply, down. Small, apply, down. It'd be kind of that, a process like that. So this is pretty typical to, for the music that you would give to the choir. But the piano would want it the other way around. They'd want their part big and the vocal parts small, perhaps. So um, at least this is done like in uh, instrumental music, uh, like a violin sonata. The violin would have only their own uh, part. The piano would have their part large with the violin part small. So I'm actually curious about something. I'm going to undo those changes. And I want to try something. I'm going to go to parts. And I'm going to create two parts because I don't think we're going to want separate parts for the soprano, alto, uh, uh, sopranos, and the alto here. I think the voc the voice part people are going to. I think everyone's going to read the full score, but I do think possibly the vo the the singers are going to want to see full size vocal staves and small piano, and the piano is going to want to see the way other way around. In any case, I want to see if I can do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create one part, and I'm going to call that part vocal. And I'm going to put all the staves in it. And then I'm going to create another part. And I'm going to call this accompaniment. And I'm going to put all the parts in that part also. So I have a vocal part that has all the staves. And I have an accompaniment part that has all the staves. But now I should be able to go to the vocal part and make the piano part small, apply, down, small, apply, down, small, apply, and there's no more downs. So the vocal part now has small piano. If I'm lucky, the accompaniment won't be that way, but I'm now afraid that it's going to have affected the piano, the the uh, the, the this part also. It didn't. Yay. Um, did it affect the score? No, and that's probably just as well. I could do it in the score if I wanted or not. So in the uh, accompaniment part, now I can go the other way around and and have the vocal parts small. So small, apply, down, small, apply. Down, one more, small, apply, down. And actually, I don't need to go down again. So now the accompaniment part has small voices and large accompaniment. So uh, yeah, that's a thing. You can do that if you want. Um, so uh, 
should one create? Yeah, so this could be worth creating as a template then. So the vocal, so the, the SATB template, because I actually use the SATB template here, it doesn't have parts defined for it at all. And to be honest, that's normal. I mean, in a lot of music like this, everyone just reads off the full score. Sometimes you do see separate parts, and sometimes you'll see just the vocal parts, just the piano part. People do it different ways for sure. So if you set things up the way you want, like say I've now that I've set this thing up the way I like it here, I want to make this a template. What I can do is save this to my templates folder. I haven't saved it yet, so I'm going to do that right now. Um, uh, give me a second. Sometimes the uh, um, things I, I I'm, I'm always making this excuse, but I, I my system gets really slow while I'm doing this cafe. Uh, the the demand of the real time streaming, I guess, is uh, pushes pushes certain things past their limits. So what I'm going to do is see I'm in a folder right now called test under my scores folder. I'm going to go up to my scores folder, and I'm going to go up one more folder. And these are the folders that MuseScore creates for you: scores, styles, images, sound fonts, etc., and templates. I'm going to come to my templates folder and save this thing, and I'm going to call it. SSA plus accompaniment. I'm going to spell accompaniment better. Now, if I create a new score, I can tell it under custom templates to use SSA plus accompaniment. And I don't know for a fact, so I, it definitely set up the parts for me. What I don't know it looks like you did not remember the size settings. So templates don't save everything. Templates like obviously didn't save the notes and that's, it, it saved them, but it didn't, it didn't quit them. When I created a new score from that template, the original score actually had some notes in it, right? Um, didn't it? Maybe it didn't. I thought it had notes, but even if it had, even if it did have notes, it would not have included those notes in the, uh, um, oh, that's because this is my one. Yeah. So my original, score that I saved had notes in it. The notes don't get included when you create a score from the template, but the stave, the arrangement of the staves, the number of them, uh, the size of the score, any style settings, like the fact that I've set, uh, or did I? I maybe I didn't set um, lyrics to be above the staff as a style, but I did move the move. Yeah, so it, anything you set as a style setting will be remembered in the template and be and new scores created from it. So it looks like though I will have to redo the size setting for the staves that that is not uh, sort of reused as part of the template. That would be a nice feature though if it were, was. So did I say uh, the choral music off in the voice part is included in the piano part? Well I don't know if I said it in an earlier session but I definitely said it today. I say this as a pianist that very often the uh, the part that I play from has the vocal parts on it. But I've also been given just a piano part and the, vo the voices have their own parts. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. If I, I like seeing what the voices are doing, it helps me keep my place, it helps me understand what's going on, helps me if I'm trying to actually rehearse, if I'm not just the hired pianist for someone else's choir, but I'm actually rehearsing this choir, I want to see all those parts. So I like re um, playing from that full score during rehearsal, but I also will say that's going to mean there's a ton of page turns. Uh, you can turn pages while you're singing. I can't turn pages while I'm playing the piano nearly as easily. So I actually do like having a separate piano part also. Um, and then, then I have to worry about, oh, if I made markings in one, are they in the other? There's no ideal solution to this, um, but it's just the way it was. Um, okay, well, friend, uh, have a have a nice day. Um, so, uh, so yeah, those are some other observations there. And um, I don't know if, if y'all have a, other questions. I'm happy to answer. But I I wanted to just be looking at some published music and look at some of the things that go on that uh, you know would be good to kind of get right and be be sure that we're. Uh, 
um, as you're presenting your music that you do this. You have your vocal part, then your accompaniment. You bracket your vocal parts. You put the brace on the piano part. And a lot of that happens automatically, but sometimes, depending on how you set things up, it might not. Like if you start with just the default empty score uh, and then start adding things to it, you're not going to get any of that business, right? The, the default empty score is just an empty score. If I try to turn it into a piano part by adding a staff, uh, it doesn't add the brace and it doesn't connect the bar lines. So I would have to double click and drag. It's one of the few things you drag to do, but at least you only have to do it once and all the bar lines connect. So I'd have to do that and I'd have to add the, the, the curly brace. So I'll select both stays, click the brace. So I'd have to do that manually. And then if I add, so I'm pressing I, by the way, to um, add I get you to the instruments dialog. If I then want to add vocal parts, I would uh, want to make sure I add them above the piano part. And I think when you add them, it was always going to get added below whatever you have selected, which is new in 3.5. It always used to put them at the bottom. Now it'll put them right below whatever you've selected. And then I can press these arrow buttons to move them to the top. But at least now that I've added a couple of voice parts, if I select one and now double click the voice, Hello. No? Well, that's curious. Voice. Add. Okay, apparently after you've dragged things around... Oh, now it's moving. Oh, I bet it was... I have no idea what was going on, to be honest. Soprano? Weird. I don't know what's happening, to be honest. Um, but I'm trying to add staves. Now it's adding them. Yeah, so now it's adding them where I want them to add. So in order, right? So, uh, so, but you would want to do that. You'd want to take care to add them in the order you want to add them in. Let's see. Um, so organ pedal parts. Yeah, if organ parts... Organ music is very typically on another uh, staff. So, in fact, if I add organ from here, organ, and actually I'm going to put the organ below the piano, so move, move it down, you'll see by default I do get three staves for organ, the top two with a brace and the third one not. Um, it didn't put, it didn't connect the bar lines. I don't know if that's proper or not. Um, that could also be because I was messing with things and that might have confused it. Um, if I just create a new score and say, hey, give me an organ and nothing else. It looks like it does connect them. through So I think all the dragging I did of moving, moving the staves up and down caused it to not be able to get the bar lines right. But if you just add an organ, it looks like it's going to connect the top two staves and not the bottom one. I don't know if that's true, if that's correct or not, and hopefully, if, if it's not, hopefully it gets corrected in 3.6, but if I need to change this, I will double-click that and drag it, and you'll see that as soon as I hit escape, it's affected all the braces, and same with the bar lines. If I've decided I really want to connect them all, I'll just drag one down, double-click and drag one down, and now they're all connected. So if that's correct, do it. So usually, <laughs> Uh, I don't necessarily always know the right answer to how to do things like this. Or, no, I don't know the right answer for whether you should do things like connect all three staves with bar lines, connect all three staves with the brace. But I can tell you, if you tell me what you want to do, I can almost always tell you how to do it. So, uh, is it a bug? Uploaded music plays, but the mark notes are not in sync. Um yeah, I guess I don't know if you, I would, um, if, if it's anything about the musecore.com website, then you should have to, you should go to musecore.com and there's a group there called improving and, uh, and ask there and post a link to the specific score. Cause no, normally things are in sync. So, um, I am, uh, been, uh, I've been going on for a while here. So we're going to stay on the, the theme of,